Hi everyone, Sal Khan here from Khan Academy. Welcome to the Homeroom live stream. It's been a little while since we last saw each other, so so good to see you again. Uh, we have an exciting conversation today with David Siegel, who's a, a co-chair, co-founder of Two Sigma, which we'll learn more about, and also the the founder and 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 head of the Siegel Family Endowment. So we're going to talk a bit about that, and uh, uh, maybe most importantly, <laughs> at least from my lens. Uh, a longtime supporter of all of the incredible, uh, of all of the work, incredible supporter of all of the work that we've been trying to do over the years and, and someone who I also consider a close friend and advisor. So I'm very excited about talking that conversation. Before we jump into it, I will uh, give my standard announcements. First of all, a reminder uh, that we are not for profit, primarily funded with philanthropic donations. So if you're in a position to do so, please think about going to khanacademy.org slash donate. Also want to give a shout out to uh, several organizations that stepped up, uh, some of them longtime supporters, some of them relatively new, but when they saw that, especially during the pandemic, our costs had gone up and our usage had gone up, uh, special thanks to Bank of America, AT&T, Google.org, Novartis, Fastly, and General Motors. And of course, uh, this is not an exhaustive list of the many, many folks who have been supporting us over the years and, and also through the pandemic. And then last but not least, there's a version of this live stream that you can get in podcast form wherever you would get your podcasts, Homeroom with Sal, the podcast. So with that, very excited to introduce David Siegel. David, good to see you. Good uh, afternoon. Uh, happy to be here. And and there's many things that I want to talk to you, David, about, uh, some of which we've, we've talked informally about, but I think people are going to be really interested. But I do want to encourage folks who are listening in, especially on social media, put start putting your questions in the message boards on YouTube and Facebook, questions about uh, investing, questions about the economy, questions about philanthropy and education. Uh, these are all of the things that we will talk about right now. Uh, but But David... Maybe we'll start with what you know your, your quote your day job, uh, which is co-running uh, um, Two Sigma. Can you explain to folks what Two Sigma is? Uh, sure. Um, we, we're, we're an investment management company. We like to uh, say that we're involved with financial sciences. A lot of people say they're a financial services company. Uh, we kind of coined the expression financial sciences because we uh, try uh, as best as we can to apply the scientific method, data, AI, and uh, analytical and quantitative methods to the investment process. Uh, you know, a lot of people think of investing as something that is done, you know, seat of the pants, that, you know, you use your intuition, gut instincts. Um, you know, we've always believed that, um, you know, applying science to a problem always gives you a better answer. It really doesn't matter what field that you're in. The application of the scientific method has really advanced uh, virtually every uh, domain uh, that we know of. Um, you know, when medicine was done, you know, in the dark ages, you know, seat of the pants, uh, you know, the outcomes weren't all that good. When the scientific method was adopted uh, and the field of medicine advanced into something, you know, really disciplined, uh, then we began to have uh, the breakthroughs that we, we have in modern medicine today. And you know, I firmly believe that investing is the same uh, uh, story. And so, two sigma, we really, uh, you know, apply algorithms, data, various other, let's call them scientific approaches to try to drive a better investment outcome. And, and it's really fascinating because you know, you you have a very deep academic background, and as you know, many academics will tell you uh, that markets are efficient. You can't beat the market. You know, just modern portfolio theory, just just buy a big basket of things, diversify, and just you know let let it ride, so to speak. But clearly, you and John Overdeck, who you founded Two Sigma with, believe differently, and, and other people believe differently. That no, there 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 is a science to this. That there actually can be ways to outperform the markets generally. What what gave you that conviction? And I am curious on your entrepreneurial journey. How did you fall? How did you fall into this, or how did you make the decision to to start an investment firm like Two Sigma? Well, um, you know, the, the statement about the markets being efficient is, um, uh, you know, it, it, you know, at a high level, it's uh, it's true. The, you know, the markets are pretty efficient, uh, and uh, you, you know, particularly these days when um, the markets, um, you know, benefit from you know ready access to lots of information, um, and and uh, and then the markets, you know, there are many different ways to access the markets. You know, hundreds of years ago, the markets were not particularly efficient. 
because you know people had advantages on information. People didn't even you know very few people had access to the markets. So you know the world is moving in a direction that is making uh, the markets more efficient, but they're not perfectly efficient. Uh, so I think you know when people do make the statements that the markets are efficient, I think really what they're saying is they're pretty efficient. So what that means is that it's actually a little bit more difficult than you might think to actually outperform the markets. But that doesn't mean it's impossible to. So the question that you have is if, if you have a belief that you're going to be able to outperform, you know, an index like the S and P 500, um, you know, what would your, uh, uh, your 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 some people would call it your advantage be? You know, what what why, why do you think? You know, what do you have access to that would give you the ability to do that? And you know, one um, uh, you know, our answer would be, well, we're, we're going to be very scientific about it. We're going to use a lot of data uh, and, you know, we're going to look at the markets, in, you know, primarily using a lot of computer algorithms in a way that it's hard for, uh, you, you know, sort of the old fashioned, very gut instinct based approach to compete with. So that would that's the reason that we believe that um, despite the fact that the markets are pretty efficient, that, you know, we can do better. And when, and when y'all were starting the firm, you know, you do, ha you did have, bra you did have experience working at previous firms like this. Was it, was it like, you know, I, I think we could do better. I think we can do better than the state of the art that's out there. And I, I'm curious to how did you, did, 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 did you and John have some initial algorithms that you had back tested? And, you know, for those who don't know, back testing is, Hey, we have a theory, we have an algorithm. Let's take this algorithm on historic data and see how it would have performed. And you're like, yeah, I think we got something interesting here. How, how did you, how did it start? I'm always curious about that, that, that phase of an organization. No, it wasn't like that. It was more just a, uh, you know, it's like any uh, entrepreneurial uh, uh, exercise. I think that people just have a belief and a conviction. And so you just, uh, you know, uh, you, you know, we, we started with a blank sheet of paper, but just, you know, literally a belief that this is the future. And, mm -hmm. you know, this is no different than I think uh, virtually all tech startups. Uh, you know, most of the successful companies that you have today uh, that have emerged out of Silicon Valley and elsewhere, you know, they've often just started with a belief that, you know, this is how, uh, you know, we can do better. And, uh, you know, so really just a, a belief. Yeah, and that that belief uh, has been validated. <laughs> um, I, I am curious, I mean, as someone who has, who studies markets uh, with a scientific lens, as you mentioned, you know, what, what there, there's been a lot of talk about a K-shaped recovery about some people are doing just fine, other people are doing less fine. Even before the pandemic, people have been talking about how automation and technology, they're going to benefit some folks, but they could hurt other other folks. I know this is an area that you've thought deeply about, and obviously you're you're in it uh, in, in, in certain ways. W where do you think we're heading from an economic point of view? What do you think the impacts of the pandemic are? What do you think is going on in markets right now? And, and what do you think we need to be hopeful for or watch out for a little bit longer term? Well, you know, these are really going to be just my personal views, not uh, not of, of the company. Uh, uh, you know, I just want to be clear, this isn't the kind of thing that the company that, that uh, you know, th these are not exactly the kind of uh, investment approaches the firm takes. So speaking really just entirely personally, uh, and, uh, you know, this is, is I don't think, um, actually uh, a new trend uh, in America, it really does appear that our economy uh, uh, has been moving in a direction where certain people are doing, uh, you know, better and better, and uh, other people are falling behind. And, uh, you know, I think that this accelerated during the pandemic uh, for, you know, a number of reasons. I can, you know, really quickly go into them. I mean, we could talk about this for hours and hours, but um, I think a lot of the uh, bifurcation of economic outcomes are being caused by fundamental changes in our economy that are driven by technology. Um, you, you, you know, the rapid transformation of the global economy, you know, uh, uh, because of uh, technological innovation, uh, the internet, um, you know, you know, you, you know we, you're all familiar with, uh, you know, obviously Google and Uber and, you know, there are dozens of companies that, you know, are virtually brand new and, you know, Amazon, these firms have changed the way all aspects of our economy function. And when you have a big economic uh, dislocation occurring, driven by technological change, that is going to, uh, you know, restack the deck. The uh, people that benefit will be different than the people that benefited before. 
Uh, other people who thought that they had stability in their work will find that they no longer have stability. The kind of skills that you need to get ahead change. You know, everyone knows today that technical skills are more valuable than they were, you know, ever before. People that have mastered uh, uh, certain kinds of technologies, and you know, AI is one of them, have you know, you know, had you know, unlimited opportunity in the new economy. People with um, uh, you know, certain other kinds of skill sets where automation has taken over uh, have been falling behind. And uh, this trend accelerated during the pandemic, in part because uh, uh, people were investing, firms were investing very heavily in you know, more automation, looking at more ways to reduce dependence on you know, traditional human-based approaches for doing things. So you know, this is one of the many factors that are driving uh, you, you know, uh, uh, you, you know what I would call an alarming uh, 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 change in our economy, which uh, you know we have to, as society, we need to address. And, and do you think this is something different about what we're going through now versus uh, you know previous periods of technological change? Obviously, people talk about the industrial revolution, and yes, people who are driving uh, horse carriages, or I guess even the horses themselves, I guess horses probably did lose a lot of work during the <laughs> during the, the automation with, with cars. But a lot of people point to that and say, well, you know, yes, a lot of, there was a lot of flux, a lot of change in things, but um, at the same time, overall jobs were created. There was a broad-based middle class that came out of the industrial revolution. So this revolution might not be any different. It could be changed, but overall it'll be better. But then you hear on the other side, people say, well, I don't know. Artificial intelligence, automation, they're kind of getting deeper into what human beings are oftentimes capable of. Um, where, where do you fall on that debate? Well, uh, you know, again, a very complicated question. Try to give a, a you know, over, probably over simple, uh, simplified answer. But um, I, 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 I do not believe that there will be a lack of jobs. Um, there is plenty of work that only uh, humans can do. And uh, as we uh, automate certain kinds of work, you know, we're freeing up people to do other kinds of work. And, um, you know, we have an aging population. There's going to be a need for more people, just as one example, more people to take care of, of the elderly. Um, there is you know, crumbling infrastructure all around America. We need more people to rebuild this. Uh, you know, the robots are not going to be handling this kind of work. Um, people have now changed their shopping habits. We need more people to deliver all the packages. Uh, you know, it's unlikely that we're going to have, uh, you know, despite all the hype, I don't think drones are going to be really uh, changing how we get deliveries, uh, in, in, you know, anytime soon. So the amount of work for people to do, it's not going away. Um, but the problem is that, uh, you know, we have to have an adjustment here and we have to decide if if we're going to be, you know, able to pay middle class wages for the new kind of work. Uh, and, you know, it is possible that, uh, you, you know, a lot of the new work, people are only going to want to pay relatively low wages for. And maybe these workers won't have the ability to uh, in any way organize to get higher wages. So you might end up with a uh, relatively uh, you know, large amount of work at wages that are you know, not really suitable for middle class living. Um, now, uh, it, you know, the previous, the industrial revolution, which is, has been well studied, of course, the outcome was a, uh, a, a vibrant, thriving middle class. But, you know, you have to remember that the transition from, say, the beginning of the industrial revolution to uh, the thriving middle class you know, also uh, brought with it, you know, World War One, World War Two. There was a lot of trouble. There was a depression in there, so it wasn't really a smooth transition. But eventually, you got to a spot that was actually pretty good. The goal here is to make sure that we don't have a bumpy ride. Uh, certainly, we don't want to repeat anything like that when we go to you know this new, this new economic phase that is being you know heavily driven by a new wave of technology. Yeah, no, it's a it's a really good point, and and you know, oftentimes the economics and the 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 history of of things like wars and and oftentimes get disjointed, but they are connected in probably more ways than even the 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 history books uh, try try to draw draw connections. I mean, what 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 do you think? You know, just stay on this this question, 
and, and I'm getting a lot of questions from, I'm, I'm assuming young people on, you know, what advice would you have for them, you know, given the, the world that we're, we're going into and all that. So I'll, I'll, it'll be a double question. What advice do you have for them as individuals, but also what advice do you, are you thinking about for society? I know you've, you've thought and you've written about some of this, you know, what's the role of government, the not-for-profit sector, the for-profit sector? How, how do you think about this? Well, well uh, you know, government, you know, again, Saul, every question, give me an easy question. The, the, you know, the role of government is obviously incredibly important in society. Uh, you know, I think people uh, in many, in, in my own personal views, people essentially take uh, government for granted. Uh, uh, because in many cases, what the government is doing is uh, providing infrastructure. They're providing things that are kind of behind the scenes. And then all the excitement that the infrastructure that government provides uh, then leads to the vibrant economy and the good outcomes. So the, you know, the private sector is built upon the foundation that the government has created. And you know, when I'm talking about infra infrastructure, I'm using a very broad definition. Uh, you know, the government, you know, in many cases, is involved with physical infrastructure like roads and bridges and tunnels. And the government may very well be involved with more modern in infrastructure uh, as well, you know, either directly or indirectly through policy decisions. The government is obviously involved with education. The government, government is involved with the rule of law, creating an environment where businesses can thrive. Uh, the, the, you know, there is no such thing, by the way, as uh, capitalism without uh, government intervention. You know, the economy is, you know, all economies, the U.S. and every country in the world, um, they're, you know, they're not just you know, the private sector without any rules. The government creates rules of the road. And so this infrastructure, very broadly, is critical for a thriving, uh, not only economy, but just for people to live good lives. And, and so I think that, you know, government, well-functioning government is incredibly important. And what, what's your, what's your, what's your advice? And I, I mean, yeah, there's a lot that we could talk for hours just on the government piece or the, the, the for profit. And we'll talk about philanthropy in a second, but on the question of individuals, you know, for a lot of the young people who are asking questions like, what should I do with my life? People are like, should I go into computer science? How should I do it? How should I navigate? You know, what, what's your message for folks? Um, how, how they should be thinking about their life given what is, what seems like likely to happen, the, the, the cross currents of technology and the economy and all of that. Well, you know, you know, first and foremost, I would start by uh, telling people that, you know, they really need to, to, to pursue their passions. Um, there's no right answer. Uh, like if I were to say, yeah, the right thing to do is, you know, become a, you know, AI specialist. Um, now, sure, that, you know, there's going to be a lot of opportunity for such people, but that is not going to necessarily be interesting to uh, everyone. Um, so I think the key thing is that, you know, in today's world, uh, you know, look, it is, you know, it, it, it's a relatively tough world. Uh, you know, people are struggling to find their way in our economy because it's changing very quickly and the skills that people need are not obvious. But I think, you know, the thing that's most important <clears throat> is, you know, to have a passion for what you're doing. And if, if it's something that you really want to do, uh, it's much more likely that you will, um, you know, put the energy into it to succeed. Um, I, I, you know, look, the obvious uh, uh, answer, of course, is that STEM skills are more important. You know, you should really get your basic math skills down. You know, you should spend time on the Khan Academy to perfect, uh, you know, the material that uh, that uh, that wonderful organization has put together. But I would definitely vote for, you know, you, you got to be pursuing something that you re that that brings you joy. Uh, your your life will be better. Uh, you know, don't pursue something simply because you read somewhere that it's going to be the career of the future. And it's very hard to predict the future. So you 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 know you might end up getting that totally wrong. Another thing I would mention is that um, uh, you know the world is changing very quickly, and what this means is that you're going to have to really become uh, you know a constant lifelong learner. And and so whatever you know your interests are today whatever you know, the skills that you develop through your uh, education today, um, keep in mind that you're going to have to continue to invest in, uh, to make sure that you know, you're ready for, for the next curveball that our vibrant world is going to throw at you. So this again uh, points to trying to go in a direction where you have a passion. 
it's kind of hard to force yourself to continue to uh, improve and, and gain new skills in something that you don't like at all. So passion, passion, passion. I couldn't agree with that more. And it's funny because, you know, I remember when, when I was a kid and I had I had I did have a passion for math and for science and, and, and for things like that and for computers. But I also had a passion for for art and drawing. And, you know, the message that I got oftentimes is, you know, first generation immigrant family like that's not going to be practical, Sal. That's a nice hobby. But, you know, you, you fast forward today and you see that, wow, you know, fields like design are actually highly sought after uh, and, and, and can be very pragmatic and, and you can do very, very well in them. And that even even you know my my own journey, um, you know I, I used to be in a, a at least a tangential field to yours. We were a different type of investment firm, but but we were in markets and things, and I enjoyed that and I had a passion for it. But I had this even deeper passion for education, and that if you just create a little bit of space for it, you know we're in a brave new world where opportunity. No one could have predicted the job that I have, <laughs> or or even the type of organization. So I think that's really good advice. Is that the combination of having really strong skills probably anything that you want to do at some form of reasonable scale and impact will involve some type of technology, but then you couple that with your passions uh, and, and you, you can be quite formidable. Um, what, 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 you know, moving on to the, 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 another big piece of your life, which is philanthropy. And as I mentioned, I'm very biased because uh, actually both you and John have been great supporters of, of, of Khan and your families have been great supporters of Khan Academy over the years. But what got you into philanthropy? Arguably, at a relatively young age, a lot of people go through their their stage where they're kind of earning, and then later in life they start going into philanthropy. What got you into it? Why did you prioritize it? And and how do you? What's your framework of philanthropy? Where do you think that you can make the, the biggest difference? Well, uh, I, you know the the uh, journey that I took into philanthropy started a long time ago. Uh, you know, uh, doing things to help people has uh, always, you know, it, it, you know, we all have to do that. It, it, you know, I think that everyone in, in society has some uh, obligation. I mean, some people say you should, uh, you know, if everyone, you know, gives back a little bit more than they take, uh, the world would be, you know, forever a better place. And and so if you think just logically, uh, 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 you, you, you know, how did you get to where you are? How did I get to where I am? I was, you know, uh, benefiting from essentially uh, uh, all kinds of philanthropic uh, uh, things uh, over my lifetime. Education in America, uh, you know, is largely supported with philanthropy. I got a really good education. Uh, everywhere I look, I'm the beneficiary of uh, other people who decided that they wanted to give back to society, and that made me uh, recognize uh, at a relatively early age that you know I want to do the same thing. And also, you know, as you start to do philanthropic things, it makes you actually want to do more. Uh, you know, so I find philanthropy to be you know in a way addictive. Um, you know, you get your feet wet, you get involved with an organization, you help them. You know, you you give with your heart, you give a little bit from your checkbook, checkbook, whatever you can do, and then I think. Virtually everyone concludes, "Wow, that felt great," and um, and you know it's so easy to get involved with philanthropy because there are needs everywhere. And so you, you know, I started in a small way, and uh, my own journey was, well, you know, how can I apply uh, what I know? Uh, you know, what what are the you know special things that I might be able to do to help and. And uh, you know, one the area that I ended up focusing on, and that my uh, the Siegel Family Endowment focuses on, is uh, essentially uh, to help people uh, 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 in the the journey through tech, the technological change that our society is going through. How are we going to prepare and help people navigate an increasingly technical and technologically driven society? And these changes that are occurring. You know, as we talked about actually earlier in, in this uh, call, Sal, uh, you know, are, are, are very, very challenging for, for individuals, for institutions, for governments. Uh, this technological transformation is something that, you know, I think that, um, you, you know, my foundation can help, uh, uh, you know, you know Im improve the outcomes a, a little bit. Um, and, and that's what we're really committed to, to be focused on. 
And, and I'm getting a, a ton of questions. There's a question related to that from Catherine Marchand uh, from Facebook. What are your suggestions for teaching young children how to be responsible philanthropists? Guidance for giving, please. And I'll expand her question. What's your advice for philanthropists in general? Because, you know, philanthropy doesn't always have the same type of objective function that you can get in the, in the investing world or the for-profit world where you can say, oh, I put this much money in and I got this much money back. In philanthropy, you're putting some dollars and potentially time and effort and energy in and there is a return and impact, but but how, how do you think about that? And how do you, what advice you have for people, both children or, or other philanthropists like yourself to, to do it well? Well, I, you know, first of all, I, 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 I you know, particularly for younger uh, folks, you know, I would put, uh, you know, a little more of the emphasis on time rather than dollars, um, because you see, you know, just, um, you know, making a donation to an organization, uh, you, you know, it, 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 it's wonderful. You should do that. Uh, you know, uh, as Sal mentioned, uh, the the Khan Academy has a donate page, and uh, I think everyone now should click over there. But there's something even uh, I think more transformative if you actually put your time into it. And putting your time into it will actually make you more likely to want to put your dollars into it. And 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 uh, you, you know, young kids generally have more time than dollars. And uh, and, and so I think that there's an opportunity to 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 uh, get uh, the, the youth involved with um, philanthropy by picking community service activities. In fact, by the way, I think that there's a big argument that um, you know in America we would benefit by having far more involvement of of young kids in community service. Uh, I think that uh, this would actually in general, make a more cohesive society. So my 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 uh, recommendation would really be, you know, to to pick philanthropic community service uh, activities. And I think it, uh, as a great introduction, you know, you do it close to home uh, because then you can see the impact of what you're doing. It can be much more direct. And then this will, I think, convince uh, even young people about how incredibly wonderful philanthropy really is because you you can just see that your time and your efforts really made something better. Yeah, could, could, couldn't couldn't agree more. And I actually think there's tons of people who want to provide them. They just need more outlets. I will put a plug for another related not-for-profit schoolhouse.world where folks listening, they can tutor, give their time, but you really are giving resources there. Your your, your, your time has a lot of, of value uh, that you can you can give to other people. I couldn't couldn't agree with, with, with you more, David. You know, these conversations are all these fun conversations always go way faster than I expected. So maybe I'll I'll just I'll just finish with one kind of big question. You know, you, you clearly are already doing many, many big things and have already done many big things. But when you look at your next five years, 10 years, 20 years, what do you what do you hope to be the impact? What what do you want the world to look like based on work that you're doing, maybe in collaboration with others? Well, you know, funny enough, uh, just this morning, I was uh, meeting with some people from my foundation talking about that very uh, question. Uh, maybe they mentioned that too. Uh, no, you know, it, <laughs> we're just linked psychically. I did not know big, that. Big, yeah, some kind of uh, you know, uh, quantum effect. Um, the, so th that's a really uh, actually the hardest question yet. Um, I really uh, don't know. I think that um, I, you know, the thing that, uh, you know, I'm learning over time is that, um, you know, really you got to live, uh, you, you know, the, the, your, the amount of, the most valuable thing I've got left is my time. And I have to be very careful of what I focus on. And I have to also be realistic of, about what I can accomplish. Um, you know, I think that, um, uh, you know, over the coming uh, decades, what I would really like to be able to do is to um, impact, um, you know, a broad range of, uh, I, I would like to make our society, and this is really why the mission of the foundation really is about the impact of technology on society. I would like to make our society be one that is more uh, fair, that um, is more inclusive, that has better outcomes for a broader set of people. Um, I think that, uh, you, you, know, it, you know, if we all look back maybe 20 or 30 years from now, I think we'll all be incredibly happy if, um, you, know, we, uh, you know, we can all say that, you know, over the last couple of decades, 
you know, America and the world uh, was able to deliver good outcomes for, you know, a diverse set of people that we were able to, to, to bring to the world, uh, you know, the, the kind of equity that in the past hasn't existed. So I'd like to be able to make an impact there. No, those are inspiring words, and I think, and I think, worth 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 pursuing. Well, well, David, thank you so much for the time. Thank you, you, your family. Uh, I mean, for just being longtime supporters of of not just resources, but your time, your advice. As I mentioned, I, I consider you a close advisor on on all things we're, we're we're up to. So, so thank you for so much for being for joining us, but even more important for being part of uh, of our journey here at Khan Academy. Solid, it was my pleasure. Really happy to be here today. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thanks everyone for joining. Um, I got to tell you, you know, David is someone I could speak to for hours, and sometimes we have uh, about about everything from investing to the economy to philanthropy, and and, and we, we have a lot of similar interests. Uh, uh, so so uh, anyway, thanks for joining this conversation. I really appreciate your questions. I'm sorry I couldn't get to all of them, uh, but I I look forward to our next homeroom with Sal. See you then. Onward. Mm -hmm.